Book 13, Part 4 of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Haggerty. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso. Translated by Brooks Moore. Book 13, Part 4. Then, recollecting how the Trojans had derived their origin from Teucer's race, they sailed to Crete, but there could not endure ills sent by Jove, and, having left behind the hundred cities, they desired to reach the western harbors of the Ausonian land. Wintry seas then tossed the heroic band, and in a treacherous harbor of those isles, called Strophides, a yellow frightened them. They passed Dulichium's port, and Ithaca, Samos, and all the homes of Neritos, the kingdom of the shrewd deceitful man Ulysses. And they reached Ambracia, contended for by those disputing gods, which is to-day renowned abroad because of Actaean Apollo, and the stone seen there conspicuous as a transformed judge. They saw Dodona, vocal with its oaks, and also the well-known Caonian bays, where sons of the Molossian king escaped with wings attached from unavailing flames. They set their sails then for the neighboring land of the Phaeacians, rich with luscious fruit, then for Epirus and to Buthrotos, and came then to a mimic town of Troy ruled by the Phrygian seer. With prophecies which Hellenus the son of Priam gave, they came to Sicily, whose three high capes jut outward in the sea. Of these three points, Pachinos faces toward the showery south, and Lilibium is exposed to soft, delicious zephyrs but Peloros looks out towards the bears which never touch the sea. The Trojans came there. Favored by the tide and active oars, by nightfall all the fleet arrive together on Zanclean sands. Scylla upon the right infests the shore, Charybdis, restless on the left, destroys. Charybdis swallows and then vomits forth misfortune ships that she has taken down. Scylla's dark waist is girt with savage dogs. She has a maiden's face, and, if we may believe what poets tell, she was in olden times a maiden. Many suitors courted her, but she repulsed them. And because she was so much beloved by all the Nereids, she sought these nymphs and used to tell how she escaped from the love-stricken youths. But Galatea, while her loosened locks were being combed, said to her visitor, Truly, O oh maiden, a gentle race of men courts you, and so you can and do refuse all with impunity. But I, whose sire is Nereus, whom the azure Doris bore, though guarded by so many sister nymphs, escaped the Cyclops' love with tragic loss. And, sobbing, she was choked with tears. When, with her fingers marble white and smooth, Scylla had wiped away the rising tears of sorrow and had comforted the nymph, she said, Tell me, dear goddess, and do not conceal from me, for I am true to you, the cause of your great sorrows. And the nymph, daughter of Nereus, thus replied to her, Asus, the son of Faunus and the nymph Semethus, was a great delight to his dear father and his mother, but even more to me, for he alone had won my love. Eight birthdays having passed a second time, his tender cheeks were marked with softest down. While I pursued him with a constant love, the Cyclops followed me as constantly. And, should you ask me, I could not declare whether my hatred of him or my love of Asus was the stronger. They were equal. O oh, gentle Venus, what power equals yours? That savage, dreaded by the forest trees, feared by the stranger who beholds his face, contemner of Olympus and the gods, now he can feel what love is. He is filled with passion for me. He burns hot for me, forgetful of his cattle and his caves. Now, Polyphemus, wretched Cyclops, you are careful of appearance, and you try the art of pleasing. You have even combed your stiffened hair with rakes. It pleases you to trim your shaggy beard with sickles while you gaze at your fierce features in a pool so earnest to compose them. Love of flesh, ferocity, and your keen thirst for blood have ceased. The ships may safely come and go. While all this happened, Telemus arrived at the Sicilian Etna. Telemus, the son of Eurymus, who never could mistake an omen, met the dreadful, fierce, huge Cyclops Polyphemus, and he said, That single eye now midmost in your brow Ulysses will take from you. In reply the Cyclops only laughed at him and said, 
Most silly of the prophets, you are wrong, a maiden has already taken it. So he made fun of Telemus, who warned him vainly of the truth, and after that he either burdened with his bulk the shore by stalking back and forth with lengthy strides, or came back weary to his shaded cave. A wedge-formed hill projects far in the sea, and either side there flow the salty waves. To this the giant savage climbed and sat upon the highest point. The woolly flock, no longer guided by him, followed after. There, after he had laid his pine-tree down, which served him for a staff, although so tall it seemed best fitted for a ship's high mast, he played his shepherd pipes. In them I saw a hundred reeds. The very mountains felt the pipings of that shepherd, and the waves beneath him shook respondent to each note. All this time I was hidden by a rock reclining on the bosom of my own dear Asus, and, although afar, I heard such words as these which I cannot forget. O Galatea, fairer than the flower of snow-white privet, and more blooming than the meadows, and more slender than the tall delightful alder, brighter than smooth glass, more wanton than the tender skipping kid, smoother than shells worn by continual floods, more pleasing than the winter sun or than the summer shade, more beautiful than fruit of apple trees, more pleasing to the sight than lofty plane tree, clearer than pure ice and sweeter than the ripe grape, softer than soft swan down and the softest curdled milk, alas! And if you did not fly from me, I would declare you are more beautiful than any watered garden of this world. And yet, O Galatea, I must say that you are wilder than all untrained bullocks, harder than seasoned oak, more treacherous than tumbled waters, tougher than the twigs of osier and the white vine, harder to move than cliffs which front these waves, more violent than any torrent. You are prouder than the flattered peacock, fiercer than hot fire, rougher than thistles, and more cruel than the pregnant she-bear deafer than the waves of stormy seas, more deadly savage than the trodden water-snake, and, what I would endeavor surely to deprive you of, your speed is fleeter than the deer pursued by frightful barkings, and more swift than rapid storm-winds in the flitting air. But, Galatea, if you knew me well, you would regret your hasty flight from me, and you would even blame your own delay and strive for my affection. I now hold the choice part of this mountain for my cave, roofed over with the native rock, the sun is not felt in the heat of middle day, nor is the winter felt there. Apples load the bending boughs, and luscious grapes hang on the lengthened vines, resembling gold, and purple grapes as rich. I keep for you those two delicious fruits. With your own hands you shall yourself uncover strawberries, growing so soft beneath the woodland shade. You shall pluck corners in the autumn ripe, and plums, not only darkened with black juice, but larger kinds, as yellow as new wax. If I may be your mate, you shall have chestnuts, fruits of the arbute shall always be near, and every tree shall yield at your desire. The ewes here all are mine, and many more are wandering in the valleys, and the woods conceal a multitude, and many more are penned within my caves. If you perchance should ask me, I could never even guess or count the number. It is for the poor to count their cattle. Do not trust my word, but go yourself and see with your own eyes how they can hardly stand up on their legs because of their distended udder's weight. I have lambs also as a future flock, kept in warm folds, and kids of their same age in other folds. I always have supplies of snow-white milk for drinking, and much more is hardened with good rennet liquefied. The common joys of ordinary things will not be all you should expect of me. Tame does and hares and she-goats, or a pair of doves, or even a nest from a tall tree, for I have found upon a mountain-top the twin cubs of a shaggy wild she-bear. Of such appearance you can hardly know the one from the other. They will play with you. The very day I found them, I declared, these I will keep for my dear loved one's joy. Do now but raise your shining head above the azure sea. Come, Galatea, come, and do not scorn my presence. Certainly I know myself, for only recently I saw my own reflection pictured clear in limpid water, and my features pleased and charmed me when I saw it. See how huge I am! Not even Jove in his high heaven is larger than my body. This I say because you tell me how imperial Jove surpasses. Who is he? I never knew. My long hair plentifully hangs to hide unpleasant features, as a grove of trees overshadowing my shoulders. Never think my body is uncomely, although rough, thick-set with wiry bristles. Every tree without leaves is unseemly. Every horse, unless a mane hangs on his tawny neck, 
Feathers must cover birds, and their soft wool is ornamental on the best-formed sheep. Therefore a beard and rough hair spread upon the body is becoming to all men. I have but one eye centered perfectly within my forehead, so it seems most like a mighty buckler. Ha! Does not the sun see everything from heaven? Yet it has but one eye. Galatea, you must know, my father is chief ruler in your sea, and therefore I now offer him to you as your own father-in-law. But, oh, do take some pity on a suppliant, and hear his prayer, for only unto you my heart is given. I, who despise the power of Jove, his heavens and piercing lightnings, am afraid of you, your wrath more fearful than the lightning's flash. But I should be more patient under slights if you avoided all men. Why reject the Cyclops for the love that Asus gives? And why prefer his smiles to my embraces? But let him please himself, and let him please you, Galatea, though against my will. If I am given an opportunity, he will be shown that I have every strength proportioned to a body vast as mine. I will pull out his palpitating entrails, and scatter his torn limbs about the fields, and over and throughout your salty waves, and then let him unite himself to you. I burn so, and my slighted passion raves with greater fury, and I seem to hold and carry Etna in my breast, transferred there with its flames. O oh, Galatea, can you listen to my passion thus unmoved? I saw all this, and, after he in vain had uttered such complaints, he stood up like a raging bull, whose heifer has been lost, that cannot stand still, but must wander on through brush and forests, that he knows so well. When that fierce monster saw me and my Asus, we neither knew nor guessed our fate, he roared, I see you, and you never will again parade your love before me, in such a voice as matched his giant size. All Etna shook and trembled at the noise, and I, amazed with horror, plunged into the adjoining sea. My loved one Asus turned his back and fled and cried out, Help me, Galatea, help! Oh, let your parents help me and admit me safe within their realm, for I am now near my destruction. But the Cyclops rushed at him and hurled a fragment he had torn out from the mountain, and although the extreme edge only of the rock could reach him there, it buried him entirely. Then I did the only thing the fates permitted me. I let my Asus take ancestral power of river deities. The purple blood flowed from beneath the rock, but soon the sanguine richness faded and became at first the color of a stream, disturbed and muddied by a shower, and presently it clarified. The rock that had been thrown then split in two, and through the cleft a reed, stately and vigorous, arose to life, and soon the hollow mouth and the great rock resounded with the waters gushing forth. And wonderful to tell, a youth emerged, the water flowing clear about his waist, his new horns circled with entwining reeds, and the youth certainly was Asus, though he was of larger stature, and his face and features all were azure. Asus changed into a stream which ever since that time has flowed there and retained its former name. So Galatea, after she had told her sorrow, ceased. And when the company had gone from there, the Nereids swam again in the calm and quiet waves. But Scylla soon returned, because she did not trust herself in deep salt waters, and she wandered there, naked of garments, on the thirsty sand. But, tired, by chance she found a lonely bay, and cooled her limbs with its enclosing waves. Then suddenly appeared a newly made inhabitant of that deep sea whose name was Glaucus. Cleaving through the blue sea waves, he swam towards her. His shape had been transformed but lately for this watery life, while he was living at Anthedon in Euboea. Now he is lingering from desire for her he saw there, and speaks whatever words he thought might stop her as she fled from him. Yet still she fled from him, and swift through fear climbed to a mountain top above the sea. Facing the waves, it rose in one huge peak, parting the waters with a forest crown. She stood on that high summit quite secure, and, doubtful whether he might be a god or monster, wondered at his flowing hair which covered his broad shoulders and his back, and marveled at the color of his skin and at his waist merged into a twisted fish. All this he noticed, and while leaning there against a rock that stood nearby, he said, I am no monster maiden, I am not a savage beast, I am in truth a god of waters with such power upon the seas as that of Proteus, Triton, or Palemon, reared on land the son of Athamas. Not long ago I was a mortal man, yet even then my thought turned to the sea, and all my living came from waters deep, for I would drag the nets that swept up fish, or, seated on a rock, I flung the line forth from the rod. The shore I loved was near a verdant meadow, one side were the waves, the other grass, 
which never had been touched by horned grazing cattle. Harmless sheep and shaggy goats had never cropped it. No industrious bee came there to harvest flowers. No festive garlands had been gathered there, adornments of the head. No mower's hands had ever cut it. I was certainly the first who ever sat upon that turf, while I was drying there the dripping nets. And so that I might in due order count the fish that I had caught, I laid out those which by good chance were driven into my nets, or credulous were caught on my barbed hooks. It all seems like a fiction, but what good can I derive from fictions? Just as soon as any of my fish prey touched the grass, they instantly began to move and skip as usual in sea water. While I paused and wondered, all of them slid to the waves and left me their late captor and the shore. I was amazed and doubtful a long time, while I considered what could be the cause. What god had done this? Or perhaps the juice of some herb caused it? But, I said, what herb can have such properties? And with my hand I plucked the grass and chewed it with my teeth. My throat had hardly time to swallow those unheard-of juices, when I suddenly felt all my entrails throbbing inwardly, and my entire mind also felt possessed by passions foreign to my life before. I could not stay in that place, and I said with shouting, Farewell, dry land, never more shall I revisit you. And with those words upon my lips I plunged beneath the waves. The gods of that deep water gave to me, when they received me, kindred honors, while they prayed Oceanus and Tethys both to take from me such mortal essence as might yet remain. So I was purified by them, and, after a good charm had been nine times repeated over me, which washed away all guilt, I was commanded then to put my breast beneath a hundred streams. So far I can relate to you all things most worthy to be told, for all so far I can remember, but from that time on I was unconscious of the many things that followed. When my mind returned to me, I found myself entirely different from what I was before, and my changed mind was not the same as it had always been. Then, for the first time, I beheld this beard so green in its deep color, and I saw my flowing hair which now I sweep along the spacious seas, and my huge shoulders with their azure-colored arms, and I observed my leg extremities hung tapering exactly perfect as a finny fish. But what avail is this new form to me? although it pleased the ocean deities. What benefit, although I am a god, if you are not persuaded by these things? While he was telling wonders such as these, quite ready to say more, Scylla arose and left the god. Provoked at his repulse, enraged, he hastened to the marvelous court of Circe, well-known daughter of the sun. End of Book 13, Part 4 Recording by Brian Haggerty, Minneapolis, Minnesota